rich. <laughs> what if you are the rich? and welcome to this incredibly awkward topic. If you've been here before, you know that I enjoy those, uh, so it's fine. If you haven't been here before and you like a bit of an awkward topic, a little bit of a chat, do subscribe because I think I think we might have a cool time today and I think that you should return so we can have more awkward conversations. My name is Lena and this rectangle is where I keep my opinions. You are more than welcome to stay, listen, and if you like the opinions, you can take them home, claim them as your own, nick them, no fee, no censors at the door, you are free to go. If you don't like them, that's cool. My perfect world does not consist of just people who agree with me. You might not find your opinions here and that's because your opinions are for your rectangle, whatever form or metaphor that might be for you. I discussed this when I was talking about veganism, but it's incredibly hard just logically to talk about an opinion when you're talking about how you feel you should act without having that also kind of just logically reflect on how other people feel like they should act. And when I hear about somebody else acting in a way that I don't personally want to act, my first feeling is threat. And that's like an evolutionary thing, okay? And also just a, we have to keep moving through the world thing. We're protecting our ego by not spending every minute on this planet questioning every default decision we make throughout our life. Because if we did, we never have the ability to be able to like run away from a saber toothed tiger or just get anything done. So my body often perceives any kind of question of my own morality as like a physical threat I get. Quickening of heart, magnified alertness, shortness of breath. Yeah, you're, you're getting ready to run away and that's okay. That's why a video essay on consumer culture is incredibly hard to write because while you're all looking at one person, I have no idea who you are in there. I don't know if what I'm gonna say is being specifically applicable to you. So all I can do is leave my opinions bendy and talk really essentially to my younger self. This video is part of a series on my channel called The 20s Toolkit where I talk about things I wish I had known in my 20s. So this video is essentially going to be the, a version of a PowerPoint presentation I would have given my 20 year old self about shopping should I have a time machine. Instead of a time machine, I I just have a silly bow on my head and a lot of empty bags around me. But we make do with what we have. This is what I would say to Mini Lena should I be able to grab her shoulders and shake her before she goes ham in the four story Coventry Primark. You get to decide whether it is applicable to you, you in there, and whether your younger self should prick their ears up. Give it a listen. It is also worth noting that I am a total dick. There is a big delay between when my beliefs shift and when my actions shift, sometimes years. I fail daily to live up to even what I might roughly think is the right thing to do, but I don't agree that just because you cannot daily enact your own beliefs that there's no point in forming them at all. Better to have convictions and fuck them up publicly than to never even have them. So in summary, here are the lies that I told myself about shopping in my 20s. And I am a dick. I used to be more of a dick. So here is my letter from one dick to another trying to be less dickish. Let's go. Lie number one. I am not the rich. Well, if I'm talking about myself, who am I? I am white, I'm in good health, I don't experience any disabilities, I have a body that the average high street shop makes clothes for, just about, and I don't want for any of those physiological needs that Maslow lays out in his little pyramid thing. Air, food, drink, shelter, clothing, warmth, sex, sleep. So I can kick back right and be like, hey, I'm bang average. I am your regular Josephine. I'm not a homeowner. I buy box wine. Never have I ever bought Farrow and Ball paint or gone on a ski holiday. I cannot be the rich, right? But while I might be right when I'm talking about my local area, my outer circle of friends, or even my country, when it comes to shopping, my wallet exists on a global scale, which means most of what I own and what I eat comes from elsewhere, which means I have to entertain two truths at the same time. Are you concentrating? I, Lena, in the small sphere of 
of constructed reality in which I live my day-to-day -day life can probably fairly say that I am average. I feel average compared to the people around me. I measure up as kind of average, but my wallet and the context in which I use it isn't. We talked in this video about the idea of first world, second world, third world countries or developing countries being not only just problematic but downright inaccurate and that idea is expanded on in this wonderful book Factfulness and I just wanted to show you a quick diagram from it. So each of these little people represents one billion people and the amount of billion people is weighted on the level of how much they earn per day how much they've got to live off per day zero to two dollars two dollars to eight dollars eight dollars to thirty two dollars and thirty two dollars or more he lays out what a level four or thirty two dollars or more a day um would look like you have more than 12 years of education you've been on an airplane on vacation you can eat out once a month and you can buy a car you have hot and cold water indoors. Your cooker looks like this and $3 a day more wouldn't make that much of a difference to your daily life. If you live a life like that, you're one of these guys over here. I'm still in the bloody top bracket of civilization. So when mini me says, I am not the rich, I just want to eat the rich, fuck the rich. <laughs> I'm like, you know not what you say, Lena. You know not what you say. Lie number two. Buying ethically isn't affordable. Well, I think what skews this conversation is this idea that a lot of us grow up with that you need to find the best deal. And if you don't find the best deal for something at the cheapest price, you're a mug. I found this great quote in this book, Trick Mirror, that talks about this idea of pricing. She says, the expense is important and does a lot to perpetuate the fetish. We pay too much for things we think are precious, but we also start to believe that things are precious if someone makes us pay too much. This mechanism is clearest in the wedding industry. So it's this idea that people are constantly trying to scam us and we shouldn't be scammed by paying more money for a product than what it is worth. But when we think about affordability, we have to differentiate between the people with big fat wallets and shiny top hats that are trying to get cider in our ear and the people who are trying to sell their labor for what it is worth. When we don't pay what something is worth, we're also not paying for what is truly precious, which is human life. I realized that the word affordable functions in the same way words like lighter, darker, louder, quieter function. They have no meaning on their own. Lighter than what? Louder than what? It becomes meaningless when you share it in an Instagram post slogan thing because I just have to be like, affordable to who? Affordable to me perhaps should be the slogan but what I perceive to be affordable is something I have been taught. Because I'm not an expert in these industries and because a lot of these industries are inherently unfair, we lose all sight of what the true cost of something really should be. This Instagram post is really great and it kind of suggests that we should start treating clothes a bit like furniture. Furniture is something that's socially accepted that it's kind of like usually more pricey than something you'd be able to buy buy every month and you don't buy very much of it but what you do buy you look after you wipe down you try and buy stuff that you'll keep forever the word afford in the mouths of like in inverted commas what in my mind was ordinary people becomes kind of like the word earned to the super rich when they're like i earned it i'm like you have to kind of unpack that sir <laughs> is it possible for you to have worked 200 times harder than somebody in your factory line maybe 10 times harder but 200 times it's the same with the word afford to me i wish i'd shifted my phrasing earlier on now i try to say instead of that's not affordable to me when i don't want to buy something that is is more ethical. I say simply, that's not a priority for me. <laughs> I'm trying to buy ethical stuff, but I've already put my resources to buy ethical stuff elsewhere. So I can't also do that right now, or I just don't want, that's just not something I want to do right now. That would at least be a more honest way of saying it. And perhaps a way to move forward is to make it more acceptable to say that, at least on a scale, at least to begin with. It means setting a boundary to say like, I'm not doing that right now, but I'm not shaming the people who are making that buying choice a priority. Because when you say like, that's not affordable, you're basically kind of shaming the people who are making that a priority and saving up for that thing. When I stopped asking what is affordable and started asking, how can I meet my own basic needs without taking away any anyone else's, I realised 
two things. One, I kind of can afford everything I really need, but I actually can't really afford everything I want. The only two movable parts of that factual situation is either I buy unethical stuff that I know is secondhand screwing over people that shouldn't be screwed over, or I start adjusting what I want. I start saying no to myself. Very hard, but we try. Two, wow, if there was fairness throughout the globe, not only would those people be paid properly, but I am not being paid what I thought I was being paid. When you look at your own share of money, your salary that you're given from the business that you are contributing your labor to, and then you try and pay other people fairly out of that pay packet, you start to realize that maybe you should get a little bit more urgent about that pay rise thing. Enter stage right, global worker uprising, or at least a more equal split of people's workplace profits. But a lot of us have moved through life believing that our employers pay us enough to have what we deem to be a comfortable life. And when you realize that they're actually not paying you that, it's just the only reason that you're able to construct a fictional life in which, in which you do have all that stuff is because of this masquerade of an ethical trading, you start to walk into that meeting with HR and being like, look, I'm not even trying to barter on behalf of me. I'm trying to barter on behalf of them so I can pay them more. So, and you, do you see what I mean? It becomes less of a selfish ask to make sure that you're being paid and compensated fairly for your work and more of a logistical necessity so that you can pay the people behind you. Making us demand cheaper, more affordable, product isn't just a byproduct of a system that doesn't pay workers fairly it's literally an intrinsic part that's the that's the plan my friends that's the plan my babes never saying babes again i can't get away with it babes babes I too really hate those tones of voice with people selling stuff that's like, oh, you need it, you have to have it, it's an essential. And I understand the kickback from that has been a small movement of people who are like, we can't, like, if, it, if it's not affordable, it can't happen at all. And then them self-defining what affordable is without, like, any data. But often that can also, honestly, to me, come across a little bit patronising because they're like, the poor people are watching. They won't know that they can't afford it and then they're going to get out a payday loan and it's all, you know, they can't, they can't possibly hear. You must shield it from their eyes. And again, that's a kind of intellectual superiority that thinks that people who are being screwed over more and have a more distant proximity to wealth, like that must correlate with their intelligence. And by taking away the stuff that costs more and is ethical, we're protecting them. It's a way of kind of rich savoring someone, if, if that's like a term, rich savior, like trying to speak on behalf of people without considering the nuances and how we move forward. It's the same with plus size critiques of ethical clothes consumption, for example. I think what's left out is that these are actually two debates going on simultaneously within the plus size industry. Number one, where you get your clothes from, and number two, the volume you buy those clothes in. The first one to me is totally valid, and as somebody who did fit into that category where high street stuff didn't make stuff for my body, I completely get it. I'd never, never tell somebody who was plus size to wear to shop because it's still a hot mess out there. But I would say that number two is still relevant. How much we buy is applicable to all sizes, in my opinion. So what I would say to my younger self while shaking her shoulders is someone else's lack of funds is a reason to use yours better. Not an excuse to mimic poverty and act like you are truly without resources, which you're like, mini leader, you're not. It might mean shifting our language from that's not affordable to that's not a priority for me right now, or it might make you shift and actually buy it. But either way, I think more accurately representing the choice that we're making rather than making it some kind of universal moral one, that's not affordable, you shouldn't sell it. I think would be more truthful to say, and God knows the truth. Well, I don't even know if it will set us free at this point, but at least it might move us on a few little plodding steps. Lie number three. This is not my responsibility. I have the freedom to choose. I think I find it so hard to think my way out of like clothes and consumerism black holes because I associate so much the choice of what I wear with my intrinsic identity and my freedom. But I thought about it a lot and I feel like one of the misunderstandings here is that power isn't a yes or no, power is a scale. Because money isn't just money and a tiny bit of power is still power. You don't hear a boss at work 
going, oh, no, I'm not really a boss. I only manage two people. Don't ask too much from me. I'm no one. This is about freedom, yes, but it's also about the freedom to be kind where it is possible. Do you see yourself as a kind person? I try to. You presumably have some kind of opportunity every single day to do harm to somebody. You could spit at people at the bus stop, you could kick a pigeon, gaslight your friends, but you don't, do you? Hopefully. And why not? And to me, thinking about the relationship with the freedom too, but that not meaning that you should, made me have to face a lot of really like gross, horrible, grimy realities about my mindset. Why is it that I have been so numb to the facts about fast fashion for so long? Because I've saw those images for a long time before I quit fast fashion. I was seeing them a lot and what is it? Is it that I feel so far removed from people in other countries that I don't feel, feel in any way connected to them or that my actions could like help or hurt them in any way? Like what desensitized me to my own body and the things I put on my body. Like, what am I numbing here? <laughs> and if you don't think that consumerism and colonialism and stuff are connected, you should obviously read this book. I have a whole video on it up here. Uh, but there's this really interesting map in it where it shows that the current trade routes where fast fashion follows are almost identical with the historical colonial trade routes. But if I'm buying fast fashion and if I was talking to my younger self, what, I'd, I'd be like, what are you trying to numb? What's going on with you? If you kick a pigeon in the street, hopefully somebody will take you aside and be like, is there something going on with you? What's happening? And do the answers to those questions mean asking for more help from the people around you, what you from what you're trying to numb or escape from? Do you need to start improving your mental health, facing yourself? Does that all become more urgent when you realise that it's not just something that you're doing, but you're doing to others? Of course the way things are set up aren't your fault. No offence, Minnie Lena, but I don't think you could mastermind this. But you also don't live on some kind of floating island separate from the rest of the planet. You don't get a separate life raft just because it wasn't your fault. No, Minnie Lena, don't walk away. Look, I know, sorry, I'm being a bit, I'm, I'm a bit on the nose, but I'm just a bit, just sit down. I'll get you another cookie, I promise. Okay, just stay a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, Minnie Lena. <laughs>
it's not my time to it's totally your time. I don't think that you rank very highly on it. It was already very much your time. You've already had a pretty star spangled life. You with your running hot water and your Clark school shoes every other year. You're bougie, baby. Maybe that argument does have some validity to it and some people would be more accurately able to claim it, but mate, it ain't you. <laughs> have you ever lived with or above or below somebody who lives their life like they are rich and they live in a detached house in the middle of the countryside where nobody can hear them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could speak to my upstairs neighbor right now, I'd say, look, I wish that for you too. I wish you had the beautiful detached house in the countryside, sir. I wish I had a beautiful detached house in the countryside. But the reality is I don't and neither do you. So your behaviour that actually also affects me is still pissing annoying and out of line. I feel like me buying fast fashion is kind of like that. I'm like, well, actually, morally, I deserve to be rich. So I'm going to act a little bit rich because like, to be honest, that's all of our right. We should all be rich. And the other bloody people I have to share the planet with are like, could you not? And also, Minnie Lena, you can't do the whole like, I'm expected to, I need to fit in. Like, since when was that your objective? And also, you're literally the norm. It's in your name. If you can't change the norm, nobody can. <laughs> and also, what other kind of weird social norms are you going to join in on just because everybody else is? You're going to have a baby? Hmm? Do you still get drunk just because it's cool? No, I do that because it's fun. <laughs> do you still restrict your eating because it's in fashion? I didn't think so. But because it's damaging in a way that directly benefits you and doesn't directly harm you, I can't, I just can't, I can't let you treat it any differently to the other social norms you've been kicking out the door since you were bloody six years old. I've started to say norm so many times that it stopped sounding like a word. Norm, norm, norm. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> if I change my spending habits, people are gonna think I'm hoity-toy and above them. Like when we talked about what the word affordable is and how it can be misused, like affordable to whom, the expectation isn't just the price of that individual item, it's the quality of that item and how many of them we can expect to, to consume. Holidays, meals out, clothes, a lot of us can afford more ethical, higher price options of these things if we have less of them, which is awkward because talking about the frequency of fun stuff because we've been taught to find only things that cost money fun is a bummer. It's a, I can't, telling people to go on holiday less. It's not a great like campaign trail, elect me like line, is it? But that doesn't stop it from being true. I find it really interesting that saying that something is designer, if you don't run in circles where designer items are just like normal and every day, that word has become an emblem that stands for overpayment or lavish. Like, ooh, she's got a designer coat. Who does she think she is? Of course there are design houses that keep all of the profit for themselves incredibly unethically and don't pay the people who actually design and make the stuff. And yeah, I suspect some of them are probably trying to rip us off and get cider in our ear. However, would you also talk about that when you're talking about like a painting artist who happens to put their art on a canvas rather than on a piece of clothing? I worry with this idea of something being designer being intrinsically linked to the phrase waste of money. Like, oh, you bought it from the person who actually invented it? Gross. Small business influencers might be a tiny bit annoying when they sing that song. It costs that much cause it takes me fucking hours. It costs that much cause I don't have superpowers. But they're bloody right, unfortunately. If you ever tried to make something from scratch yourself, you know. In her book, Why Fashion Matters, Frances Corner talks about this thing called the cappuccino effect. Why are people prepared to pay double, triple, or even quadruple for a cappuccino instead of opting for a cheaper instant coffee served in a plastic cup with powdered milk? Apparently it's a thing called designer thinking. We are willing to spend far more for a cappuccino because of all that accompanies it. The origin and the quality of the beans, the sophisticated espresso machine, the stylish cup and the saucer, perhaps even the fact that you get a small biscotti as a bonus. Design thinking can be tangible too. That perceived talent of the barista or the attractiveness of the waiter could also contribute to factors in the decision to skip the instant option. If you've seen what women want, you'll know that marketing 
characters are trying to tell you a story. And while that can be a weird scammy like purposefully manipulating thing to do, it's weird because they're actually filling a very real void. Where does our stuff come from? Where is the story behind all the weird shit that's in our lives? Is that why we want to hear those stories? Because we kind of feel like there is more? to know about our items. The absence of a narrative behind the racks we're choosing from leaves a kind of chasm for less well-meaning brands to swoop in and tell us a completely fictional story in the absence of the truth. But if we actually knew the truth or could see the truth more readily, like just like a barista, like you watch them make you a cup of coffee? What if the garment workers were actually in the shops? Would you so easily be able to turn around and say, really? 30 pounds for a top? Because I wouldn't feel nice for the bloody garment worker standing in front of you, you wouldn't say it aloud. If you've ever tried to sell your knitting or your cakes at a craft fair, you'll know the first-hand awkward pain of having to sit there while people assess your work and decide whether it's worth it. Imagine that, but you sitting there knowing that you've already priced, say, that cake lower than the time it took you to make it, plus the flour and the milk and the rolling pin and everything you had to own to make that cake and somebody still turning around to you and being like well that's a bit expensive feels like shit rather than just turning around and being like i can't get that right now but it looks so amazing i look forward to buying that cake in the future you're very talented i mean i know that feeling and i give my work away for free and i still get complaint letters i can't even give this shit away <laughs> watching a hannah louise poston video made a penny drop for me she did a whole no buy year and then talked about her philosophical thoughts around what she experienced during that year and she had this phrase that she used saying aping wealth that she realized she was buying the accessories to a life that she didn't have because she refused to accept that her life hadn't turned out a different way and instead of being able to have that life she just bought the accessories like the coat and the and the necklace that she would have worn in that alternative life because she hadn't yet reconciled herself with the fact that she had her arguably less fancy but much better life. And that's where the intersection of all these ideas really confused the hell out of me. I want to eat the rich, or at least tax the rich, but I am the rich. And I don't want people to think that I'm aping wealth by buying stuff that's more fancy or might cost a little bit more, even if they can't see that I'm actually buying less of it. But I'm actually kind of also already aping wealth by buying high volumes of clothes and stuff, artificially lowered in pr price by screwing over other people that I've never met, which is what got us into this bloody fire hell <laughs> mess in the first place. The need for dopamine hits, like every now and then, can be really fun, but if you need that every week, there's probably something going on, Minnie Lena. Maybe you should address that. Sit with that for a second. If you're having an emotional time and you go out to shop about it, you can't shop your way out of a personal crisis any more than you can shop your way out of a planetary one. But instead of trying to fix ourselves or make life less fun, what if we try to transfer that need for dopamine and encourage our bodies to feel that way when we treat garment workers better? Try and train ourselves out of getting a dopamine hit when we skimp on a non-essential item and thinking of that as like a treat. Like why don't they deserve to feel as valued as I do when I buy myself the new thing that they made to give me the dopamine hit to make me feel, you know, you see what I mean? <laughs> it's a mess. I guess what I'm saying is, what if we became each other's luxury product? Now that will make a cool story. <laughs>
one of those adulting people that you always <laughs> make ironic comments about. Being a grown up isn't having a baby or getting a mortgage, it's being able to tell the difference between a need and a preference. My realisations around this led me to loads more revelations around my whole life and it was hard and it's something that I it takes a long time and a lot of thinking and a lot of chewing but it ultimately came to a few realizations. I had a previously skewed idea of how much things cost which therefore in turn me meant that I had a previously skewed idea of how much I actually earned and how wealthy or unwealthy I was. There's two solutions to that asking to be paid more or a more immediate solution for most people realistically although I would love everybody to be paid more and the workers rights to be fairer is to accept that maybe I need to live a more stripped back simple life to live ethically on the wage that I do have and deal with that realization that I'm not as rich as I thought and at once at the same time hold those two realities richer than I ever imagined because I'm in that little one billion person. A more ethical version of your life might, it might actually not look that fancy to other people or it might look incredibly fancy but those are other people's thoughts. You will actually know the facts around what implements and objects are in your life and how they got there and knowing that brings some kind of peace I think or at least some kind of not that I've got there yet, I'm still quite shit at it. As I've mentioned, I'm kind of a dick. Let's do the conclusion, shall we? This video made me uncomfortable to write. It made me uncomfortable <laughs> to read out. And it might have been uncomfortable for you to watch. But in the words of Arja Baba, recognize that if you're in a position of power and someone with less power tells you about your actions and how it harms them, you're not hurt you're just feeling discomfort. And that ability, again, to be able to tell the difference between hurt and discomfort is one that I constantly try to mash into my brain and deal with. And while these are things that I would say to my 20 year old self, they're not necessarily things that I would say to your 20 year old self. In fact, maybe they're things that I should be saying to my 40 year old self, because I am the first to say that I'm constantly failing at all of the thoughts that I had in this video. And to be clear, here are some other reasons that I might not be talking to you. A, you experience a disability that stops you being able to access a more climate friendly solution. Jessica has some wonderful videos on this and there are like 14 million I think people in the UK experiencing some form of disability right now so I'm not discount that's a thing. B you have a plus size body and you struggle to find stuff in your size like we talked about before that doesn't discount the volume of stuff you consume but you do you get what you need I am not here to judge you. C you are experiencing an incredibly urgent and serious financial struggle and it is critical at this time for you to prioritize your personal survival. D you yourself live above the poverty line but you live in a country or a place that doesn't have access to many ethical alternatives online or offline or d maybe you live on a different planet and you're watching this video from far far away and earth's climate crisis is more like a fizzling bubbling sitcom to you and you're just waiting for the boom at the end before you go and get a tea good for you so the question that some of you might be wanting me to answer is can you afford to buy ethically Nice try, I'm not answering that question. You can't, you can't make me. However, having eavesdropped on my discussion with my younger self, I hope that it's given you something to think about even if you disagree and something to spring off so you can form your own opinions on things. I try and keep this channel as close to the truth as possible but also cheerful, hopeful. So here are my three hopes. One, the revolution will be fun. It'll be crack, it'll be a good laugh and we will find other ways of having luxury around us and, and excitement and that we won't like look to just hanging around in shopping centres on a Saturday picking our nose and turning tags over and trying to discuss whether something's affordable or not. There's got to be funner ways to life. Two, I hope we can expect less physical stuff in our lives and reconcile ourselves with the fact that there's going to be less in our lives but so that we can all expect more from life, that we can all get more, that people, other people can actually have life and that will be a cool thing and and the last one that we become each other's luxury product and that that's what we splurge on and we consider that a fun splurge a good splurge something to get excited about I'm gonna end this video on an incredibly intellectual note and misquote Macklemore he's like make the money don't let the money make you change the game don't let the game change you so I'm gonna say to mini me spend the money don't let the money spend 
you. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this is part of my 20s toolkit series. You can watch that here. This video and all of them have been made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per video to make sure these videos keep happening. Do subscribe because I would like to see you here again for some more orcs conversations of. Thank you so much for watching. Tell me what you think below, please. Frog's not out.